And uh, as she said, I'm from Bolivia, so uh, I have a little bit of an accent, so bear with me, okay? <laughs> but we feel honored to be here. And we feel really like in home because we see so many familiar faces, you know, of all the teenagers that have gone the mission trips over the years. And it's also nice to see them grow up. And all of them are in college now, so it is exciting. Yeah. And um, I want to encourage the church for those kids that are coming, the next generations, keep doing mission trips, keep take them, taking them out, because it is a life-changing experience, and it's definitely worth it. And uh, with that being said, thank you for having us tonight. And um, well, a little bit about a typical child in Bolivia and a typical child in the United States. Well. Like everywhere in the world, you know, one place to the other is a little different, I guess, growing up in this area is a little different, a little different than growing up in New York City, you know what I'm saying, right? But in average, let's say, uh, Bolivia has about 70% of the population, and I'm going to get to the part that the kids will love in a minute, that it's, that lives in a rural area, and it's on a, uh, on a, uh, under the line of poverty. So, for example, for the kids, when you go to your school, you have a smart board, right? Most of the teachers, if you go to school, a public school or a private school, they have a, what they call a smart board, which is basically a computer on the front so your teacher doesn't write things anymore, they just use PowerPoints. Well, in Bolivia, most of the kids will still use a chalk, you know? So in the school, you still have that black board, and it's very dusty because of the chalk that the teachers are using. Also, the school is in Spanish. You know that? It's not in English, because Bolivia is a Spanish-speaking country. But um, you don't have all the safety regulations that you have here, so you don't have your nice uh, fence and your park where you can play, your playground in the school. Most of the kids will go out and just have a little soccer field made of cement, and they will just kick the ball the whole time that they are doing the day on their races. And I have no clue what the girls will do. <laughs> Probably just hanging out. <laughs> but uh, so most of schools in the country they don't have really nice playgrounds. So it's more like the kids have to use their imagination, you know. Um, it's a it's a very different way of life. Most kids in Latin America, in the rural areas, they help their parents after school. So a lot of people are farmers. So the kids have to wake up really early in the morning and help, help a little bit in the house. And then they go to school and then when they come back, they come back to their chores. You know, whatever it is they have to do. So no Nintendo or, or uh, what do you call it, video games, you know. And uh, it's a very more old-fashioned kind of life. So uh, I don't know what else, I mean, you can ask questions and then I'll answer you. What else would you like to know? <laughs> the grown-ups can ask questions too. To make it interesting. Yes, sir. Did you have television growing up? Yes. Yes, I do. I did. I, I grew up in the, in the city. So I'm like a New, New Yorker version of a Bolivian. <laughs> but there is a big area of the country that they have television, but the, not cable, because the cable doesn't get there yet. So they probably are stuck with one or two local channels. But yeah, yes. What kind of weird things did you do? Well, it's not weird there, of course, but what kind of things um, might be eaten there that, that aren't eaten here? Well, there's a lot of things that are eaten here. Yeah. Um, I think it's like Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, the food in Bolivia usually is really good because it, the, the foundation of the typical meals are meat, you know, beef, and, uh, and potatoes. But uh, some weird stuff, uh, <laughs> there is a typical thing that is usually is eating a lot, is a cow heart. You know? They just slice it, and they grill it, and they put some uh, spice on it. And it's, she says it's really chewy, chewy but that's, <laughs> One typical thing that you will find all over the place, and people love it. Yeah, so I will make you eat it if you go there. Don't worry, unless you want to. <laughs> but yes. 
Um, what kind of things did they learn? Did they learn the same kind of stuff that you learned, like math and mm -hmm. science? Yes. Um, School is a little different there, uh, especially high school, because high school here you start going with credits, right? You have kind of elective classes. Well, in Bolivia, everybody goes to the same... If you're in a school, everybody has the same classes, so they don't do electives. But yes, basically you have your five basics, which will be math, science, or biology, and uh, physics... Uh, no, that's when you're old. And when you're little, you do literature, you know, reading and all this stuff, and, History, so you do all the, all the basics, and I, I know you do one more, but I haven't been in school in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you do, that. you do the same basics. Speaking of school, is it just yes. one teacher that teaches all the you, that The traditional way of the elementary school is one teacher that, uh, that, that takes care of the major classes, and then they usually have an art teacher and a PE teacher, but in elementary school, it's most of, usually one teacher. Now, when you get to high school, you have different teachers for each one of the sides. Yes. So, uh, but uh, the schools are usually not as, uh, as big as here or as nice looking. You know, they are a little smaller and uh, a little more uh, old fashioned, I guess. To put it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our kids are in trailers, so I don't know if you guys are that much. <laughs> let's do, what do you say, four more questions? Because I saw three hands there. Yes, that's good. Okay, we have one there. Um, what is their market? Is it like different ones or grocery stores? Well, yes. Shopping is very different. There are groceries, grocery shoppings, like big places where you can go, like uh, Harris Theater, if you have that here. Or Lowe's Food or Lion, you know? Here, Lion. Those. You, there, is, there are those in the cities where you can just go and do your grocery shopping there. But there are also the street markets. So basically, once a week, they close the, they close the street on different areas of the city, and people come there and they put, a, they put their uh, sales. So, uh, so they sell all the things that you need. And people like to go there better because it's fresh, and you, you, know, you know it's coming straight from the towns where they produce them, so it's cheaper too. So it's a whole different, but you need to know your way around to be able to buy there. So if you're a foreigner, you should go to that grocery store because it's faster. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, do you have a, a cafeteria at the school, or do the kids bring their own? Uh, it wouldn't be like your idea of a cafeteria, which is a closed place where you have all that. Usually what they have is a little kiosk in the, back, in the playground. So uh, they cook some stuff there, or you have some drinks and things to buy, and kids will just go there and buy stuff. And they, they will just eat outside, wherever they can find a place. You, most schools won't have a big cafeteria. A few schools do, but not, not traditionally, no. Yes? How about healthcare in your country, especially for the sick? Well, that's a very, very interesting way of how Bolivia does it. Because Bolivia is a, what is called a mixed system. And it basically uh, has three different kinds of healthcare. They have the public healthcare, which is free, so it's uh, access for everybody. And um, it is good on the quality of the doctors, but the fact that, make that it is free, sometimes you will, they, they will lack the supplies that they need for all the people that come. So that's number one, the government one. Then you have all the way on the other end, the, the private one, which is just, uh, basically you just go and pay. And if you can pay it, you get it. If you cannot pay it, you don't get it. And that's usually very nice, and, uh, but it's not to the access of everybody, or just for those who can pay. And then Bolivia has a different healthcare system for the, the working class. So basically, depends on where you work. Uh, for example, Bolivia is big on petroleum, so all the oil companies, they have their own healthcare. And all the banking has their own healthcare. So if you work for a certain area, they will have their own hospitals and doctors, kind of like the insurance works here. So that's what most people go to. And that one is good. Yes. Okay. My sister wanted to know, do they have a different form of money than us? Yes, it's called Boliviano. Boliviano. And it's actually, I, can, I have a bill here. You want to see a bill? Yeah? No? Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, actually, only five to ten percent are um, born again Christians. Wow. So it's really it's a very low percentage. <laughs> This is a ten Bolivianos bill. So this is worth about one dollar and twenty cents. <laughs> so you see that each bill has different colors. So depends on the color you know how much. And of course it has a number. But once you get familiar, you just see the color you know how much it is. At least a twenty and a half. You gonna see it? You can see it. <laughs> this is a ten. So with this you can buy about one dollar and twenty cents. Because it's a money exchange, you know? So it's like when you're gonna buy candy, right? You have to pay some money and it will be, give you some candy, right? A different kind of candy costs a different kind of money. So this is the same with this, you know? So this is 10, this is 20, and this is one half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a 100 is about how much in dollars? Yeah, I'm right. Yeah, it's about twelve dollars. Sorry, it seems like money. But yes, only five to ten percent are Christians, and um, the majority of the rest are either don't have a religion, or it's more of a like an indigenous religion, or it's a mixture with Catholicism and the local religions. Because what a lot of what happened uh, was they'll. A lot of people would come in, like the um, Catholic Church would come in, and to convert the people quickly, they would just change the local traditions and say, oh, instead of you worshiping this idol, that's Saint Simon or that's Saint Mark, so pray to him. And so a lot of the the witchcraft traditions and things are still carried over. So a lot of people practice a variety of things in their daily spiritual lives. So. But we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. Okay, perfect. Well, we're just excited to be here with you guys. We have a table right outside, so Jonathan can put the, the bills out there so you can see the money if you didn't get to after church. Um, but my name is Kara, and I'm from North Carolina. And Jonathan and I met in Guatemala, where we were serving as missionaries. So... That was a joy and a lot of fun, and we really just enjoy serving God and sharing Jesus' love and salvation, because that's really the, the one thing that matters in life, is that people know that they have a Savior, and our desire is to share that with everyone that we come into contact with. So we're in the process of moving to Bolivia. We're going to be serving as missionaries there, and we move on February 10th. So we're very excited about that. Um, we're working on getting all the paperwork ready and everything so that we can move, and we'll be there really soon. So we're really excited about all that God has in store, and Jonathan's going to tell you a little bit about what we'll do there. But I really wanted to share for a few minutes about what we believe are some things that people should know about missions and that Christians should start getting involved with as far as missions are concerned. And so I just really wanted to share... Um, three things, and that's praying, sending, and going. I feel like those are three things that the church and Christians as individuals have a calling by God to do. And so if you'll join me in going to Matthew 9, verse 36 through Okay. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the fields. And so something that I believe that the church and each individual Christian, when I say the church, I mean the people in the church, not just the building, uh, but Christians have a call to pray for missions. And that means pray for missions in the local town, pray for people, that people will have someone come and share Jesus with them. Because that's what it is. He's saying that the harvest 
is great, but the workers are few. And that means there's many people out there. For example, in Bolivia, 90% of Bolivia does not know Jesus. But there aren't many people telling them about Jesus. So pray. One of our callings as Christians is to pray for the people, for people to go, and for salvation to be brought to, to everyone. And so one of the things that we're called to do is pray. And the next thing is sin. So if you'll join me in Romans 10, 13 to 15. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. So, there are people who need to hear about Jesus in your neighborhood, at your school, across the town, in another country, all over the world. There are people who need to hear about Jesus. And how are they going to hear unless someone goes and shares? And how are they going to go unless they're sent? So one thing that as Christians that I believe we're all called to do, this is everyone, praying we are all, every single one of us called to pray. Sending, every single one of us are called to send. What does that mean? Help people go on the mission field. Help people go across town. Help people go and share God's love in any way that you can. If that's sending shoeboxes, if that's supporting financially, if that's preparing supplies, however God puts it in your heart to help, we're all called to help share the gospel. And so one of the ways that we're called to do that is by sending people to go into those harvest fields and share his love. And the last thing is that we're all called to go. We're all called to go somewhere. It could be to our neighborhood. It could be across the world. But we're all called as Christians. We have something to share, and that's Jesus' salvation. And so I want to share the Great Commission. For those of you who know where it's at, it's Matthew 28, 18 to 20. So go join me there. It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is what Jesus is telling his disciples. He's telling them, go into all the world, and make more disciples. Share Jesus with them and help them to obey all the things that Jesus taught them to do. And how are they going to do that if they don't teach them and share with them and disciple them and just spend time with them and build relationships? So I know that the people that I learn the most from are people I spend time with. And so if I'm around people, I can share his love. If I don't ever go around anyone, I don't think I'd be very effective. And so one of the things that we're called to do as Christians is to go. So if you go to the grocery store, if you go to school, go to work, wherever you go, we are called to share this love that he's given us. And also, we're called to go to other places. And Jonathan and I, for example, are called to go to Bolivia and share his love there and make disciples there and work with people so that they can experience his love and salvation. So wherever you are, those three things I truly believe we're all called to do. Sometimes when people think of missions, they think, oh, those missionaries over there in another country. And that's true. There are missionaries in other countries. But also, what has the Lord shown you that you're to do? And sometimes it's not that we have to hear an audible voice. Sometimes it's opening the Bible and seeing he tells us to pray, and he tells us to sin, and he tells us to go. Wherever we go, we can share. And so I want to encourage you
that wherever you go to share, find a way to speak life. Maybe there's someone that you've been praying for or thinking about. Pray that God will open the opportunity for you to speak into their lives. Pray for people to, to cross the person's path that can share life with them. And pray for people who go to other countries, who go to other places. Because the number one thing that people need is not health care. It's not, it's not stuff. It's not running water. We all need that. That's important, and we want to help provide that. But the number one thing that people need is Jesus' love and salvation. Amen. And so we want to just encourage you to, to do that as we do that too, and to pray for us as we do that as well. And that's what we're going to be doing in Bolivia. And Jonathan's going to come up and share a little bit about that too. Amen. So, uh, Hallelujah. I think those are the are three favorite verses in the Bible, passages in the Bible. And every time I hear them, it reminds me, you know, there's a traditional saying of missions, and I'm sure some of you, if not all of you, have heard this before. You know, if you, you have to pray for missions, you have to send missionaries, or you have to go. Have you heard that before? The famous praise and go? Well, praise and go is true, but the way it's stated traditionally is wrong. Because it's not, oh, I'm praying, or oh, I'm sending, or oh, I'm going. It's, I am called to pray, I am called to send, and I am called to go. We are all called to do those three things. It doesn't matter where you are. Because I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says, you shall just pray and not do anything else. Or you shall wait for others to pray for you while you do things. It doesn't say that, right? We all pray without season, and we all share the gospel. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And the same thing with sending. We all send someone somewhere. Yeah, right? If you send a little, the, the teenagers that are going here on their outreaches and mission trips, you are sending. If you are supporting a missionary family overseas, you are sending. When you are tithing here to your church, you are sending. Yeah. Right? Because this church is sending others, and the pastor is here preaching you, so the, the pastor is sent by God to be here preaching to you. Amen? Amen. Yeah, so we're all sending. We all have to have parts. If you're not giving into something, then you're missing a part. Amen? No, I, wanted, I didn't want to talk about that, but I just got inspiration right now. And then the going, we all go. You know, like Kara was saying, we are called to go somewhere else. But you might just be called to go to school here. Well, that's your mission field. You know, if you work in a company around town, that's your mission field. When you go to the grocery store, that's your mission field. The Bible says that we are leaving letters. Which means that people are reading from you every day, wherever you go. You know? So, just be careful that they are reading what God wants them to read. If not something wrong. Right? Yeah. Amen? So, on that same train of thought, we are called, Kara and me, to go to Bolivia, South America. And, uh, well, four years ago, God took me to Guatemala. And Kara was leading mission trips for about five years to five years ago. She started leading mission trips to Guatemala, and she felt a call to go down to Guatemala too. And we met there. And um, I always have that feeling that I wanted to go back to Bolivia. You know, Bolivia was always in my heart. And I, when we started talking together, I told Kara, Bolivia is in my heart, and one day I'm going back there. So she said, "Okay, me too." <laughs> So, we always have Bolivia in our hearts. That's what I'm trying to say. Bolivia was always in our hearts. We were just waiting for the right time from God. And we were saying, serving God in Guatemala. And we love Guatemala. And we learned so much. And we appreciate so much the Guatemalan people and all the great people that we met in Guatemala. Like many of you here. But Bolivia was always there in our hearts. You know, like, when you're, you know you want to do something, you know, like that teenager that wants to be a doctor, wants to be a doctor, but you're still in school, you know? And then when you graduate and it's time to go to med school, you're finally up there, you know? The promised one. And it's kind of like that, you know? You're on a preparation season and that season is over and now it's time for us to go down and do what is in our hearts, has been in our hearts for many, many years. So, 
Let me tell you a little bit about Bolivia. I already answered you all some questions. And the reason, you, usually I have pictures going on, but I found them sometimes distracting, you know? And we all want to see pictures, and we have a PowerPoint out there in the table. So if you want to see some pictures and things, they are out there. You can go and see them after the service. But just bear with me for a few minutes, okay? Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? Bolivia is a fairly large country. Just to give you an idea, Bolivia is two and a half times bigger than Texas. So it's a lot of land. Guatemala fits 10 times inside Bolivia. But Bolivia only has 10 million people living in the country. So it is not many people on a very, very large area. Now, half of those people, about 5 million people, live in three major cities. The, the, which are called La Paz, Cochabamba, and Santa Cruz. So half of the people live in the urban area, in the big three cities. And the rest of the people are spread all over the country. Okay? Now, Bolivia has about 70% of indigenous population. This means native Bolivians. Okay? So let's say, like, instead of being a, a small group of Native Americans, you will have 70% being the people that were here before the colonization came, right? So there is a lot of indigenous people in Bolivia. And a big group of these are the Quechua people. The Quechua people are 40% of the country. What, what does this mean? Out of every 10 people that live in Bolivia, four of them are Quechua, right? Now, we want, it is in our heart, to reach out to them, to the Quechua. Why? Because usually, big ministries and the work tends to go closer to the city. So if you go to the city, Bolivia, you will see a lot of development. You will see, as you were asking before, nice grocery stores and schools with cafeterias and healthcare and big churches. But if you drive a little bit outside the city, all that will disappear. When you go out to the country, you will find some churches that are made still of mud. People sit of uh, not even uh, little stools, or sometimes they will bring a bricks and just make their chairs out of bricks and sit there just to hear the gospel. I know people that they walk, they walk seven, eight hours to get to their church, and then after the service they go back to their towns. You know, so. There is hunger, people that want the Word of God, but it's just not available always. Because we're not called there. You know? So, Karen and I, are, our heart is to go there. But we know that two people cannot do the, the, the work, right? We're just two, we can go to a little town and do something, but that's it. So we also want to work with the local church in the city and teach them and talk to them about the Great Commission, about what Kara was talking to you before. You know, many of us have heard that before. Oh, the Great Commission, yes, we should go and preach. But sometimes we don't know how to. Have you ever found yourself in that place where you want to do something but you just don't know how to do it? Yeah? And those of you here that have gone on mission trips uh, to Guatemala, you know that when you get to Guatemala, you're given tools, right? You, give a, you get a little booklet and you know how to approach people and they teach you some dramas and it's kind of lay it out for you. So all you have to do is just follow the steps and you will accomplish a lot and reach out to a lot of people. But why is that so effective? It's because there is someone who has a know-how. Yeah. Right? But the thing in Bolivia is that Bolivia is one of the countries that has the least percentage of missionaries in Latin America. That means that more missionaries are in other places than Bolivia. And being such a big country with few people and not many missionaries, there is not too much know-how. Right? So our calling is to go to the cities there, pardon, sorry, that was Spanish, Spanish. <laughs> go to the churches in the cities and start teaching them about missions, the heart of missions and the how-to. What we learned all these years in Guatemala, working with teams, working there with a, with a great ministry that is serving the Lord in Guatemala, now we're called to go there and teach them, teach the church in Bolivia, we need to reach out. You know? 
We need to go and get our own. Preach the gospel. Like the Great Commission in the book of Acts. When it says, Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the rest of the earth. Right? I know a lot of churches in Bolivia who are dreaming about sending missionaries. And they keep saying, we want to send missionaries. But, well, if we don't know how to get out of the door yet, how are we going to go to China? Right? So that's our calling, is to teach the church. But also we want to go to the towns and go to the, to the indigenous people and go to the little towns there and help them. You know what? I believe that Christianity is, is a lot more doing than talking. Do you agree with me? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I can tell you I love you the whole day. But then, when I see you, when I see you laying down on the street, I find you, run you over with my car, right? But <laughs> I love you. That's not love. Love is action, right? That's why God sent His Son, because to show us love is action. Amen? Yes. And that's what God has spoke to our hearts to carry me. Show them that I love them with your actions. So we're called, in, so our work, number one, is to plug with a, with a local church in the city. I'm sorry, sometimes my Spanish and my English get mixed up. But, and teach them about missions. But then, okay, we have a missionary team, we're going there, what are we going to do? We're going to love them. So we're going to go to these villages, to these towns, not to lecture them, not to tell them how bad they are and how good we are, but to love them. To reach their practical needs and tell them, hey, we're here because God loves you. We are here because we have a message that you're loved. Amen. You know? Yeah. And that's our heart. Is for them to really feel that love. I want you to understand something. The Quechua group in Bolivia, not only the Quechua group, the other indigenous groups in Bolivia, 500 years ago, they were discovered by the Spanish people, right? No, this has nothing to do with races, it's just history, okay? <laughs> but you know, what, you know what's the big difference between the USA and the rest of America? When people came here many years ago, they came to establish colonies, right? Basically, they came with families looking for freedom and they started working, right? And they, made, they built this amazing, big, great country that you have. Well, Latin America wasn't really that way because it was already populated. And the people that came there, they came to conquer slaves. That was the purpose. It wasn't to look for freedom. It wasn't to start a big, great, amazing country. It was to look for slaves. That was the real reason. So they came with a big army and they pointed at your head and they told you, okay, now you work for me. <laughs> okay? Oh, by the way, we are Christians. So now you're Christian. And if you say, no, I'll put a bullet in your head. So what would you do? You say, I'm a Christian. The, those were Catholics. Now, I have nothing against the Catholic Church. I'm not going to that. I'm just saying how history went. Okay? Yeah. So that's why everybody says, I'm Catholic. I'm Catholic. I'm, but what is Catholic? You know? I mean, what is what does that mean to you? Well, basically in Latin America, at least in Bolivia, it means when, you're, when you have a baby, you baptize them on the church, 12 years after, you take them to the first communion, and then about 5, 6 years after, you take them to do their confirmation, and now they are Catholic. They are, so whenever they feel terrible, they just go and do their confession. And I'm not saying that that's Catholicism, I'm just saying how it works down there, okay? So a lot of them will claim 80% of the country is Catholic. Yeah, but they have never cared about Jesus. They don't know that Jesus loves them. They know a name. They know a crucifixion there that says Jesus, but they don't know what it is about. They haven't heard that message of love from God. So what they do, they also practice their, their rituals that they knew how to do before. Amen? So that's what they do. They, they, they go to the witch and they go to the priest. So which one will work? But we know that that's not the way. Amen? Yeah. We know that Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, the camino, la verdad, y la vida, the life. I know, in Spanish. Yeah. And the life. Amen? Yeah. Amen? But they don't know that. So even if they say I'm Catholic, they don't know the message of the Bible. They don't know the message of Jesus. And someone needs to tell them. But for 500 years, they've been taught that Christianity was just going to church on, on certain seasons. Right? And now they are looking for freedom. They are looking to be free of that oppression for so many years. 
of that anger of having been put down for years. And I believe that God is the solution. Do you agree with me? Do you agree that God is the only one who can build a bridge of love between groups of people who are in conflict with each other? Amen. Amen. So, this is our heart, and this is what I wanted to share with you. Here, you have something that is amazing. You have a nice church where you receive the word of God constantly, where you have a community of Christians and believers. Amen? Amen. But that's something that a lot of people don't. We drive to church, and if it is too cold, we don't go to church. But again, there's people who were walk for four, five, six hours just to get to a church. To receive the word from a pastor who had received the word 20 years ago from someone. So they don't have the privilege of studying the word of God constantly. You know what I'm saying? But we can do something about it. We can do something about it. And that's what the mission work is about, is to reach out and say, here, we're here for you. We're going to teach you. We're going to train you. But we're, also, we're first going to love you. Amen? Yeah. So we're going to work in the city with a local church in the Quechua towns. And to do this, we're going to use some tools. And we're going to be done in five minutes. Amen? Am I good? Okay. <laughs> we're going to be done in five minutes. We're going to use some tools, because again, the distances are, high, are very long, you know, to go to one, from one town to the other, sometimes you need to, if you're driving, it will be two, two and a half hours to go from one place to the other. So, the first thing, the first, that tool, but I don't know how other way to say it, uh, that we have is the local church. You partner with a local church, and you start doing discipleship, and training, and teaching. And uh, God has blessed us with a person that we met that they have developed these little radios that they are actually solar powered and they have the whole Bible there. So you know what is amazing? I can just go to town and leave one of these and even if they don't have electricity, they just use the solar power, you know? And I just tell them, hey, why don't you go ahead and, and listen to the Bible this week and then when I come back next week, we can discuss what you listen. Oh, yeah. You know? Because if I only get to go once a week and I have to read the Bible with them, by the time we're done reading the Bible, there's no time to teach, no time to talk. But if I can leave something with them that they can listen to, then when I go back, we can elaborate from there. Yeah. We can answer questions. We can establish relationships. Amen? Yeah, really, uh... So we're looking and praying that we will be able to raise a little more funds for that, to buy a few more of those radios to be able to live more in some towns, because we think that it's an amazing tool. Most of the Quechua people, and most of the indigenous people in Latin America, they are what is called oral learners, which means that they don't know how to read or write, or even if they know how to read or write, they prefer to listen. Because traditionally, they've been taught through stories, not through books. So if I go and tell them, read your Bible five minutes every day, you know what's going to happen? They are not going to do. Yeah. I can tell them, I can explain them why it's good for them. They're just not, even here, most people don't do it. <laughs> but if I give them a little break and tell them, listen to these five minutes every day, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to, they are going to listen, probably more than five minutes every day. So they are going to be fed with the Word of God constantly. Amen? Amen. So that's, those are tools. We're looking to use tools to be able to reach to them more effectively. And what amazing tool are mission trips? You know, some people don't believe in short-term mission trips, but we do. Because we have seen them for many years, and we know that they are effective. Uh, and they are as effective for the ones that are going as for the ones that are receiving. Yeah. Because when you go to a mission trip, your life is going to change somehow. Even if you hate it and you never want to go back again, it's still going to affect your life in such a way that it's going, you're going to think things and see things differently. And you might love it and feel and that would, might be the start of a calling that you have in your life to do something greater later on. You know? You don't have to love it, but you have to go at least once in your life. But mission trips help a missionary to do something that you couldn't do by yourself. You know? So another tool are mission trips. And this is what we want to do. And this is where you all come. I mean, I'm not telling you, I'm not on a mission trip tomorrow. I'm not saying you. 
But we all, when I mean you all, I mean the church. The church needs to be involved. Somehow, somewhere, in something. Amen? Amen? So, okay, it's amazing what they are doing in Guatemala. It's amazing what they are doing in Bolivia. Yeah, but you can do the same amazing things. Which one of you? Pray, send, and whenever you get a chance, go. And when you're not going overseas, remember that wherever you go, that's your mission field. Whatever you're doing, that's your mission field. Our mission field is this country in the south called Bolivia. A country with out of every 20 people, only one or two have heard about the real message of Jesus Christ. A country where most of the things are centered in three major cities and the rest of the country is forsaken. It's a major challenge. Yes, we're excited, a little scared at the same time. But we know that God is calling us there. We know that He has a plan. And we believe that years from now, whenever we visit you guys again, we're going to come with great reports of the amazing things that God is doing there. And many, many people will come to know Jesus and their lives are going to be changed. And you are all a part of this just to your prayers. And we appreciate that the church is being really generous to us over the last few months and years. And we really appreciate this church and we love you guys. But you are a part of this. So we appreciate your prayers and we want to encourage you to keep praying for us, please. Amen. Amen. And if you ever want to come and visit us, the door is always open for visitors. <laughs> because we want you guys to get to know. It's amazing. Place. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We have a little... Sorry, sorry, Pastor. I just... I didn't see. Oh, sorry, I was just looking <laughs> We have a little table back here with a, some pictures, as I said, and some prayer cards. If you guys want to pray for us and remember us, just feel free to pick one and take home with you. We would really appreciate it. We appreciate your time.